Thank you, children, for leading us this morning. I want you to open your Bible with me to Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, the same verses that we just heard Brother Drew read as we lit our Advent candle. As soon as we hear the word peace, we think of something that's external and almost unapproachable. I mean, we believe in peace, but we do not believe that it's attainable for us. I mean, just think about it for just a second. How much peace is in your home and in your heart, and how much do you long for peace? It's kind of like a, an elusive unicorn. It's always just right there beyond your grasp. You can't quite get to it. In the four millennia of recorded history, humans have been entirely at peace for only 268 years, according to the New York Times. Or just 8% of all recorded history. The entire world is, is longing for peace. Paul says it's, it's groaning, waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. The poet Henry Longfellow wrote when he heard Christmas bells during the dreadful days of the Civil War, he wrote these words, and in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Yet the Bible proclaims in Luke chapter 2 that we have perfect peace in Christ Suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Now I want to tell you this truth before we read from Isaiah 9 again. You'll never have true peace until the war in your heart is won. Now, we're going to unpack that a little bit, and we're going to see about the war that's raging in our hearts. But truly, Jesus is our Prince of Peace. The Lord has fixed the day where He will return. And what we'll see is not the baby in a manger, but what we will see is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords riding on a white horse, coming with judgment on the earth. No soul, no human soul will escape the day of judgment. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The only thing that will preserve you through the judgment of God is to be covered by the blood of Jesus. But here's the thing. On that day, He will not be your Savior if He is not your Lord. There's two thrones. There's a throne in heaven where Jesus has conquered and he's reigning today. But there's also the throne of your heart. The battle in heaven is won. The battle for your heart has begun. For those of us who know Christ as our Lord, we've settled the score. We know that it's Christ who is the King. And we've made him the Lord of our lives. Is that true for you? Isaiah reveals the source of lasting peace in in this passage. And it comes from allowing Christ to have his position on the throne of your heart. Now, why don't you stand with me? If you've got your Bible open there to Isaiah chapter 9, stand with me. We're going to read this together again. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 written 700 years before Christ came. Verse 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, And of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it 
with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let us pray now. Heavenly Father, thank you that you love us the way that you do. That you would send your one and only Son to be born of a virgin, to live a sinless life, to be condemned as a sinner, nailed to a cross, to pay the debt of our sin, and then to be raised again on the third day. Lord, it's too wonderful wonderful for us to comprehend the depth of your love for your children. Lord, we pray that you would help us. Help us, Lord, to understand the words of this text today. Help us to apply them to our hearts. And help us, Lord, to make peace with those around us by making peace with you. Lord, may the peace of Christ reign in our hearts today. And not just today, but throughout this Christmas season and on into the new year. I pray, Father, that the world around us would see that there is a God who reigns in our hearts. And his name is Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Peace is not merely external tranquility but it is internal stability. I need you to recognize that peace is not the same as tranquility because tranquility is a lack of feeling or emotion, and it's a lack of of strife around you and all of those things. And that's not the case with the type of peace that Christ gives us. Rather, it is a reaction to the noise and strife around us It is clarity in the midst of confusion. It is a stable, secure rudder of a ship that is battered by the waves. To know Jesus is to know peace. He is our Prince of Peace. I want you to see three characteristics of our Prince of Peace in this passage from Isaiah's prophecy. Number one, I want you to see first the conquering power of our Prince. The conquering power of our prince. Now, you're going to have to back up with me to verse 1 and read and see some of the context here of Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. But look at verse 1. But there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the, t- the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had established the nation of Israel through many years of rebellion and and turning away from God. Yahweh had preserved His people from warring nations, giving them great victory over their enemies. And yet the people continued in their rebellion. Doesn't that sound a lot like us today? God has done so much for us, and yet we still turn away from Him. And return to our sin. The Lord finally said, enough. I mean, that's a dreadful day for us whenever God says this. Listen, whenever God says, enough, have it your way. That's a terrible day for us. You want it your way, you have it your way. And so God had said that to the nation of Israel. He had told them, you're going to be handed over to the nations for destruction. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, and Galilee of the Gentiles, all that represents that northern, those northern ten tribes, the northern region of the land of Israel. The first tribes to be invaded during the uh, Assyrian exile of the northern ten tribes of Israel happened in 740 B.C. And in 722, Samaria fell. And the nations were carried off. And the Bible says that that God had treated them with contempt. He brought them into contempt. In other words, God was against them because they had turned their backs on Him. And so then 
They lived in gloom and they lived in a, 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 a darkness that shadowed over everything that they did. And it's a picture of the, the world around us, the lost world around us. In Ephesians chapter 2, we read this passage in our Sunday school this morning. The Bible says the world is without hope and without God living in the world. The world around us, the people around us, they're without hope and without God. That's utter gloom and utter darkness. The words uh, gloom literally mean lack of light. And it's not a lack of physical light. It's a lack of spiritual light. People had no revelation from God. They had turned their back on the Lord. And when they turned their back on the Lord, the lights went out. But, the Bible says, in the latter time, He has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Well, what we understand from the New Testament is our New Testament writers tell us that the fulfillment of this prophecy written 700 years before the coming of Christ was when Jesus stood up there on the hillside in Galilee and began proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. The Bible says that in those days the light was shining upon the people who had been walking in the darkness. Isaiah prophesied a new day for the children of Israel when they would no longer suffer under the threat of war and they would come back to their land victorious over their enemies. And they all believed that it was going to be a conquering king who rode in on a white horse. Instead, it was a carpenter from Nazareth who stood on a hillside preaching peace and saying things like, Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. Verse 2 says, The people in darkness have seen a great light. People who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep, deep darkness, on them has light shone. People walking in darkness around us today, you know what they need? More than your judgment and more than your, your glances and stares at their sinfulness. What they really need is for you to shine some light into their heart. They need you to be the light for them. Jesus said, he said, I am the light of the world. But before he departed, he told his disciples, you are the light of the world. And he sent them out to share that light with those who are in darkness. They've seen a great light. Genesis 1 and verse 4 God saw the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. And for you and me each and every day, we are called to walk in the light and then to share the light, to spread the light. God gives joy and prosperity to those who are walking in the light. Look at what it says next. You have, in verse 3, you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. They are glad when they divide the spoil. And if you think about this, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali and the, the land of Galilee, they had all suffered under the yoke of oppression. They had been burdened and torn down by the other nations and the fields didn't grow. The children didn't run up and down the streets with joy. No little, no little kids were skipping and jumping and the animals uh, weren't hopping around and the birds weren't singing and it was just total darkness. And then the prophecy that says, now the people are going to return to the land and they're going to come in as if they had just conquered another nation. They just, they're, they're returning like a, a warring army who's just won the victory and they're coming back home with the spoils of war. That's, that is such a picture of a life that was in darkness and in bondage under sin. And now someone just went to them and told them about Jesus. And they put their faith in Jesus and now they're saved. And now they proclaim that to everyone around them. There's joy there. 
The Bible says there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who gets saved than 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Heaven rejoices over somebody who is saved. And this is the picture that we're seeing here. The yoke of his burden, verse 4, and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. Do you remember Midian? Who fought the battle of Midian? You know who fought, who fit the battle of Jericho, right? I don't know what fit is anyway. I guess it's an old English term for fight. But you know who fit the battle of Midian? It was Gideon. Who was Gideon? It, the Bible says that whenever the light shone on Gideon, Gideon was hiding in a wine press because he was afraid of the nation of Midian. They were coming up against him. And, and the Bible says the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Hell, hide uh, Hell, mighty man of valor. And Gideon said, who, me? You talking about me? Well, Gideon gathered up his army to go fight out against Midian. And, and God said to Gideon, you got too many. And he started sending them home. Tens of thousands of soldiers went back home. And God reduced the army of Gideon, of Israel, down to 300 men. And those 300 men whooped an army of 500,000 Midianites and chased down their princes and killed them with the edge of the sword. And Israel was free from the oppression of Midian. Why does, why does Isaiah include this in his poetic, poetic prophecy? Well, he includes it because he's reminding the people of the conquering power of our God. And what this is all about, it's not about Midian and it's not about other nations. It wasn't about Rome in the day of Jesus. It's about the sin that reigns in our hearts. You see, what happens with every one of us is every one of us chooses whenever we get to be a certain age, we choose to allow sin to reign in our hearts. There's a battle that's being fought over the territory of your heart, over the throne of your heart. And it's the same battle that was there in the beginning whenever Eve was in the garden and the serpent said to her, You will not surely die, for the Lord knows that the day you take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be open. You'll be wise like God, understanding both good and evil. And in that moment, Eve began to believe the lie that she could be in control, that she could have what she wants without God. She didn't need Him anymore. And so she saw that the fruit was desirable and she took it and she ate it. And that war has been raging in the hearts of every single human soul from that day until today. Who's going to be on the throne? Will we allow the desire for For possessions, will we allow lust? Will we allow uh, selfishness? And all of those things to be our God? Or will we allow the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to have his place on our heart? Verse 5, For every brute of the trampling warrior in battle tumult And every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. In in Ezekiel, it talks about how the Lord is going to uh, cause the nation of Israel to burn all of their implements of war in this great bonfire. This great fire that says the war is over. The battle has been won. We're going to celebrate together. And one of the ways we're going to celebrate is we're going to take all of the firearms and all of the swords and all of the ammunition and everything. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to throw it in the fire and watch it go boom because we don't need it anymore. And that's exactly what happens in the life of every person who puts their faith in Christ. They get, they get this sudden peace in their heart because Christ has won the victory. On Christmas Eve in 1914, during the horrors of German trench warfare, German troops began decorating the trenches with candles and Christmas trees. As the glimmer 
of the light of the candles arrived at the trenches of the British troops on the other side. The sound of carol singing could be heard. Silent night, holy night. And from the darkness, a lone British soldier joined the chorus. And soon Germans and British were joined in the heavenly chorus singing carols in the night that followed several days of peace and celebration commemorating the exchange of gifts between the soldiers because of the peace that was in their hearts that night. Jesus has pronounced the utter defeat of the enemy. Now look at what it says next. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now you think about that for just a moment, and we're going to move on to point two in just a second. Isaiah reveals in chapter 7, a child would come from a virgin. So back in Isaiah seven fourteen, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. So we know the identity of this one, this child who was born and this son is given. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. But then next it says, the government shall be upon his shoulder. When I think about that, you get this, you imagine this, this image, a baby with the weight of the world on his shoulder. Do you see that in this text? You see that? Here, where he says that a baby, a child is born and a son is given. And the next line says the government shall be on his shoulder. He's going to bear the load for all of us. When he puts the weight of the world on his shoulder, your burden is lifted. Peace is all about who is in control. When you have the awful sense that life is out of your control, you'll have no peace. But here's the truth. You were never built to be in control. Control is just an illusion from the devil. It's the same lie that deceived Eve. That she could be in control. You cannot be in control. Only Christ is able to be in control. Now imagine a long flight. Midair, the voice of the flight attendant comes over the PA and says, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to begin our final descent. The pilot is still sleeping. Would any of our passengers be willing to land the plane? Would any of those passengers be at peace? No. I mean, what airline in their right mind would ask passengers to fly the plane? I mean, excuse me, what other, other, what other airline besides Spirit Airlines would be willing to allow their passengers to fly the plane? Um, and so we see the conquering power of our prince that he is absolutely able to win the battle for us and then to take the burden on himself. And then secondly, we see the comforting presence of our prince. Now look at what it says next. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Wonderful Counselor. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to bring comfort into the life of the believers. Remember John chapter 14, whenever the disciples were so upset because Jesus had just said that he was going to be killed and he was going to leave and that where he was going, they could not come Jesus said to them, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. And then he goes on to say that he would send them the comforter, the Holy Spirit, to be with them. No matter where we are, if we're in Christ, we have his spirit in us. Wonderful counselor, mighty God. Psalm 24, 7 through 10. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. See, when you open up your life to Christ, you open up your life to His reign in you, 
And then because of his reign, he brings his peace with him. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, the strong and mighty. The Lord the, who is mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates. And lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. He is mighty God. And he's mighty to save. He's near to you and He's drawing near to the sinner today. Maybe you're here in this place and you don't know Christ as your Lord. What I tell you is you'll never be at perfect peace until that war for your heart is won. Until you say, I'm going to open up my heart and I'm going to let Jesus sit on that throne. And He's drawing near. His presence is coming near to you today. It's not a mistake that you're here today to hear the good news of the gospel. And what he's saying to you is that you can have peace in your heart today if you will put Jesus on the throne of your heart. And that's what he'll do if you'll let him in. He's mighty to save you. Everlasting Father. Jesus also told his disciples, he told Nathaniel who was doubting, he said, I and the Father are one. He said, if you've seen Me, you've seen the Father, everlasting Father, and then Prince of Peace. If Jesus is the Prince of Peace, what does that make the devil? Well, he's the king of chaos. He really is. Why do we fight with each other? Why are we at war with one another? Why is there strife in our homes? It's because Christ is not reigning in our hearts where He should be. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Ephesians 2, Paul teaches us about how Christ has torn down the wall of separation between us and God. And now because the wall of separation is torn between us and God now, the wall that separates us from the people around us can be torn down as well if we'll learn to forgive and make peace the way Christ has. Now listen to what he says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who are formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You see, God has opened up the door and He's brought you in and He said, Listen, you can sit with me and I'll sit with you and we can be together. By the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. Who made both groups into one. Broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity. Which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So that in himself he might make the two into one new man. Thus establishing peace. And might reconcile them both into one body. To God through the cross. But having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away. And peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. In other words, what he's saying is because God has torn down that wall of hostility. And you know that you're forgiven as you stand before a holy God. You're forgiven of all your sins, past, present, and future. Now you can forgive those nearest to you whenever they hurt you. And you can forgive the guy that cut you off in line. And you can forgive the guy that didn't treat you very well whenever you were out Christmas shopping. Or the lady who kind of got that last one of whatever it was that you were trying to get. And even families fight at Christmas, don't they? Shouldn't be that way for us if we know Christ. And listen, as far as it's up to you, what does Paul say? Live at peace with one another as far as it's up to you. You know what that means? That means it doesn't matter what they do. It matters what you do. It matters how you treat them. And it matters if you know Christ... How you represent Christ. That's what matters. Not what they do. So even if they do treat you wrong. And they will. Just remember that he is your prince of peace. 
that you can go to him. He's near to you. A life without him always leads to despair. But a life with Christ is a life of peace, even in the midst of a chaotic world. All right. So first you see the conquering power of our prince. The secondly, you see that that absolute... <laughs> where's my notes? <laughs> what was the second point? <laughs> That's pretty bad when the preacher can't even remember the second point. Do you remember it? I turned my paper over. Comforting presence of our prince. And thirdly, the keeping promises of our prince. Now, I worded it that way on purpose. Some of you are going... That's strange. Why did he say it that way? Well, that's because I like to say things in a way that's going to make you think. And so he goes on to say in verse 7, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Notice the will be in that. So that's what tense is that will be? Future tense. It's a promise. It's a prophecy. There will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it. So we see that the Lord is not only promising, but he's also continuing to keep his promise. And the people that are reading Isaiah's prophecy need to know that. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali and the land of Galilee, the land of Judah even, they need to hear that the kingdom of David will not end because God had made that promise a long time ago. And they're wondering, was God going to continue to be faithful to his promise? Second Samuel 7 The Lord says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, talking to David, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish a throne of his kingdom forever. Now, you know the story. David's descendant who took the throne was named what? Solomon. Did Solomon's kingdom last forever? No. The Bible says even his children divided the kingdom, and then later on, the thrones were overthrown by warring armies. And so had God forgotten his promise? Second Samuel verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 16, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me, your throne shall be established forever. Did God keep his promise? Absolutely, yes, God kept his promise because Jesus was a descendant of David. When Jesus came and was born from the Virgin Mary, he had the fullness of God and the fullness of man. And all the promises of God were true in him. The Lord keeps his promises. But secondly, his promises keep you. The Lord keeps his promises, but his promises keep you. So he says, on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. When I think about that word justice, you know, in order for his kingdom to be just, it means that the people in his kingdom have to be justified. And in order for his kingdom to be righteous, it means that the people in his kingdom have to be made right. And that's you and that's me. From this time forth and forevermore, the Bible says that we are forgiven from all of our sins and that we are part of his kingdom. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this, will do this. See, God is zealous about you and me. Jesus said, my sheep know my name, and my sheep hear my voice and I know them. And he talks about how no one can snatch them from his hand. Nobody can change that. The moment that you put Christ on your heart, on the throne of your heart, is the moment that he writes your name down in the Lamb's book of life. And he says, I will hold you forever. I will keep you forever. And nothing will ever change that. Have you put Christ on the throne of your heart? 
Have you made Him the Lord of your life? The keeping promises of our Prince. There's a promise that He has made. He said, All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And somebody would say with me, Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes? Somebody would ask me, Do I know that I'm going to heaven? I've asked plenty of people that. And some people say, I don't know. And I say, I know I'm going to heaven when I die. How do I know that? How can you know that for certainty? How can you know that you will spend eternity with God when either you die, the Lord takes you, or the Lord comes back to get you? How can you know? Well, you can know because of the keeping promises of our God. The promises that keep you. That he said, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Have you called upon the name of the Lord? You know what that means is make him the Lord of your life and say, you are Lord, you are master, you're in charge. You deserve the throne of my heart. Have you said that to the Lord Jesus? I want to give you the opportunity to do that now. I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. It's your admission of your need for Him. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit to you that I'm a sinner. I've done things that are wrong and I've failed to do the things that I know are right. And I deserve the penalty for my sin. To be separated from you forever. But Jesus, I, I know that you died on the cross for me. You took my place on the cross. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. And give me a home in heaven with you. I'll spend the rest of my life loving you and serving you. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Won't you stand with me? If you prayed that prayer, the Bible says there's rejoicing and a great victory has been won in your life. Sin no longer has dominion over you. You are free. You've won the victory. You've been made new because of your faith in Jesus and His saving grace that's been poured out in your life. If that's true for you, you don't, we don't want to hold that in. We want to share that. And so we're going to give you the opportunity now that if you've prayed that prayer, we're going to ask you to come forward and confess Christ as your Lord to everyone around. If you need prayer, our prayer counselors will be here to pray with you. And you can just pray at the altar or in your pew if you want to pray to the Lord. He'll hear your prayer today. And if you're looking for a church home and you believe that the Lord is leading you here to Myrtle Grove Baptist Church to be a member, we welcome you and we love you and we receive you. And so this is your invitation. You use it as Christ would see fit.